Uh, she's a lawyer, uh, but she's a, a good lawyer. We make fun of lawyers, but believe me, uh, if you were going to be going to court, you'd certainly want to have Constance on your side. And uh, basically, I'd never heard of Constance coming. I'd been studying what was going on probably for close to 20 years. And I always knew I was missing something. Uh, I knew there was a force out there somewhere uh, that was so vague. It, 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 there had to be some sort of logic to what was going on in the world, but nothing really made sense. And until I came across a book that was called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, and it was written in the early 1980s, and I read it, and it began to bring me into an understanding of the for that there really are spiritual forces which are energizing everything that's going on. So without further ado, Constance Cumby. Thank you very much. That last talk is a very hard act to follow. And uh, it's, I started sounding alarms on that. The sustainable development component was one of the things I observed back in 1981 when I started my research. And one of the things that alarmed me enough to actually drop seven years from my law practice and sound alarms on the New Age movement, because I looked at it and I said, my god, this is the stuff of which Nazism was made. They were talking about global population reduction, Levin's ROM, living space, breathing room. So I'm going to, I fought two wars over the last 25 years. I've been in two big battles. And I did not initially think they were related, but increasingly I can see the battles are very much related. And the first war was, I had was, misfortune to be the first major evangelical critic of the New Age movement. And I stumbled onto it accidentally in 1981. And this is how it happened. My husband lost both legs above the knee in 1979, October 15, 1979 to be precise. And I was happily practicing law and thinking I was safe for life. And that was a major disruptive fa uh, factor. I went into literal shock. For the first time in my life, I could solve higher mathematical equations. First and the last time in my life. And I sat there and I was solving logarithms and working advanced mathematical calculations. And you have to understand I went to law school because it was the only curriculum in the whole university that required no math. <laughs> <laughs> and I seriously thought I was going to have to go back to school and retrain to be a doctor. In fact, I bought num numerous books on it. And, then I went back to normal, 2 plus 2 equals 3, or is it 5? I'm not sure which. And there was a, a Methodist bookstore across the street from my downtown Detroit law office, Cokesbury Books. I went in there almost daily just to find things to help me make it from one day to another because it was a very, very tough period in my life even after I came back to normal on the mathematics versus the words. And I read things that I thought would get me through a very difficult point of my life. And when I was through with the good books in the store, and they had lots of good books and lots of good authors, I found another line of books. And the books were by Baptists, Catholics, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Mennonites. And the books were saying things like, we need a new world order. We need to make this paradigm shift. Up until I discovered the New Age movement, I thought paradigm was 20 cents. <laughs> we need a, a transformation. We need to see ourselves as part of an interconnected whole. God's ways aren't our ways. Perhaps he intended for us to call him Shiva. And I started thinking I was looking at some very serious religious apostasy combined with some political elements. I 
worked for the Michigan legislature, the House of Representatives, before I even became an attorney. And I knew my way around political circles, and I knew political action campaigns when I solved them. And this looked like a combination of religion and politics. So one day I made a little trip over to the Archdiocese of Detroit to see if the same trends were continuing over there. And to my surprise, I saw many of the very same books, same authors, same propaganda line, same cover, everything was the same except on the side of the Catholic books was a logo that said Paulist Press. And on the side of the, many of the Protestant books that I found with disturbing themes was a logo that said InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And I thought, isn't this cute? Here all the Protestants are being reached with a call for the New World Order by InterVarsity. And all the Catholics are being reached by Paulist Press. There were others, other publishers on both sides of the logo. I'm not singling those two out per se. And I thought all it cost them was a little change in logo on the side of the book. And I really didn't put it together. I, one day I bought five books and took them home and just sliced and underlined, yellow highlighted, and marked the common elements. One of the books was Towards a Human World Order by Gerald and Patricia Meshi, and yes, they were talking about sustainable development. Another book I bought was Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger by Ron Sider. And I, a book, When Gods Change, Hope for Humanity, by a professor at the Union Graduate School of Theology. I believe his name was John McCoy. Bought a little book on process theology. And the books all sounded far more like each other than they did their, the respective teachings of their respective denominations. And I wondered where were they getting this? I thought for the very first time in my life that maybe I should write a book. And I was going to call it, my original thought was, call it, come out of her my people. The Growing Apostasy of American Religious Life. I had no idea I was looking at something far, far bigger. And I had a very prophetic thought that came to me. I never thought of myself as a prophet, but this day I had a thought that was distinctly prophetic. I never thought, would anybody publish your book? Would anybody read your book? The only thought that came to me was, boy, will you ever catch it if you do. Well, I wrote the book, it ended up being called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, and I've been catching it ever since. And what happened to me along the course of that work was very interesting. I, the opposition came from where I least expected it. The support often came from where I least expected it. When I found these facts that compelled me to write it, I remember I sat there and I thought political suicide, professional suicide, political suicide, professional suicide. And I finally just started brightening the corner where I was. I started with educating the people in close circles to me, the ones I came in contact every day. And every person in our office could tell you about this and have an intelligent discussion. Everybody that waited on me on a routine basis where I ate lunch in downtown Detroit could tell you about it. And friends that I thought would abandon me kind of closed ranks behind me and basically gave me some pretty good moral support while this was taking place. I remember I showed the materials to my pastor who went on to become the head of Moody Bible Institute. And I thought he would take the ball and run with it. I hoped he would take the ball and run with it. Basically, he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And at that point, I thought, my clients pay me for advice. They'll listen. So my clients, anybody that scheduled an appointment with me, ended up getting a seminar on the New Age movement, whether they wanted it or not. <laughs> And they went out and they told their respective ministers and priests and friends about it. I had a call one day from a Catholic priest in Detroit, Father Edward Perone, and he said that um, a parishioner who had not darkened a church door in many years 
had uh, come to see him and uh, was terrified. He said, what did you have that scared this man so badly? I invited him to come take a look. Well, he came to my office on a Friday afternoon. He looked through my materials. He gasped at some of them. He said, I can hardly believe I'm holding this in my hand. And finally, he said, I have to accept the truth of what you're saying. He said, I saw too much of this going through the seminary. He said, we have a terrible job facing us, how to wake people up without scaring them to death. Because when I was looking at the materials, and I have something that on the computer I'd like to show you later when I can set up adequately for the PowerPoint. But 1983, the New Agers really thought they were going to pull things off in 1982. 1982 was a target year for them. 1975 was a target year to make teachings on their new Messiah public. But at the point I was looking at it, I didn't know I was looking at that yet. I didn't understand fully what I was looking at until I found a book by a California writer named Marilyn Ferguson called The Aquarian Conspiracy, Personal and Social Change in the 1980s. And all the things I found disturbing, she found encouraging. She said, now the heretics are gaining ground. Doctrine is losing its authority. And knowing is superseding belief. And she quoted from a book called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. And for some reason, when I read the quote, I thought it was terribly important that I find that book. And I did track it down the very next day at the Methodist bookstore, I'm sorry to say. And Dixie, Dixon Bible and Books, which was owned by a member of my own church, I'm sorry to say, had copies of the book in stock as well. And it was basically written in King James style English. And this was about Jesus, obviously, the Jeff Setter. He wasn't hanging around Palestine. He was traveling to India and China. And the Aquarian master sitting in council had um, told us that Jesus was not always the Christ, that just as Jesus had earned the degree Christ by a life of strenuous service and equipping himself to find the Christ consciousness, um, that Jesus wasn't always, just as Lincoln was not always president, Edward was not always king, neither was Jesus always the Christ. He had earned the degree Christ by these uh, certain practices. And they had John the Baptist was also out seeking wisdom. And he also had pagan masters. And John the Baptist one day asked his pagan masters per this version, the Aquarian Gospel. He said, why do we need any further illumination? These teachings, the Vedas, the Upanishads, these are so sublime, so perfect. And his master explained to him, he said, in the past when man needed illumination and progress to advance to a further point, the masters would send Send, send somebody, said, but now the ages have passed. And he said, in their proper place, the Hebrew Psalms and Bible, the Hebrew Psalms and Proverbs were given for man's enlightenment. Said, but now that age has passed, and it is time for more revelation, and Jesus is the flesh-made messenger to bring that light to man. But in the ages yet to come, man will attain to greater lights. And greater lights will be needed and sent. And I wrote in my margin a neat trick. I said, and finally at last, a mighty master soul will arise to light the way to the throne of perfect man. I slammed that book shut. I was spastic. I knew I just looked at something about and promoting and preparing folks for the Antichrist. And I had to learn more about it. My um, the information sources were deficient. Marilyn Ferguson said that folks that were involved in this communicated with code words and signals. That they 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 were made kindred by their inner earthquakes. 
And that's very important that you remember that because that's the glue that binds them together. It's not money. It's an ideology, but it's basically mass hypnosis. Folks, by one method of mind control, one method of, of, of spiritual deviation, one method of going out of their minds, make this, quote, paradigm shift. And this is what the, quote, Christian books were also talking about. I've since collected some. By One was SPCK, Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge. It was from England, and they actually told us we should pay heed to Benjamin Krem and Alice Bailey and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. I decided that if they communicated that way, that maybe I could tap into that. And I didn't know what their signals were. But she said they used code words, and I was having a pretty good notion of what their vocabulary was. Things were done holistically. We lived on spaceship Earth on a crowded planet, all the emphasis on crowding, in a global village. We needed to make this new paradigm shift. We were entering this new era, so on and so forth. And so I carried two books with me day and night for two weeks, hoping I could find somebody that would pick up on it. And one book was The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson, and the other was The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. Well, I ran into somebody, a um, pleasant fellow, but he was bordered on the left, and he um, told me he was thinking of running for city council. About every, I knew every politician in Detroit worth knowing on a first-name basis. And I said some pleasant words to him and didn't think anything more about it. And he called me a couple of weeks later and said he definitely was going to run for city council. And he and his wife, Marge, would be so delighted if I would come to their house and join them for a coming out party the night before. Well, it was Sunday night, and to tell the truth, after I found this material, I was not interested in anybody's political campaign. In fact, I wanted to go to the nearest church and curl up under the nearest altar so I wouldn't get into any more trouble before things came down. And as I thought, if this is going on, things are very close indeed. And so I was on my way to church to curl up under that altar Sunday night, and all at once I thought, maybe you'd better go to that party. Somebody's likely to be there who can tell you more about it. If they're not at that party, it's not big enough to worry about. He was a nice guy, but he tended to attract the eccentrics. So I headed over for the party, and he introduced his campaign manager. And I had had one strange conversation with this woman a year earlier. When Barry was coming out of the hospital after six months in the hospital and rehab, and Phyllis Warren, that, that woman, uh, came into the Penobscot building, downtown Detroit, where I had my offices, and she was in the colonnade cafeteria, and I was down there with the law clerk eating lunch. And she walked over to the table and she said, Hi, Connie, how are you? And I said, Terrible. And she said, What's wrong? And I told her about Barry's accident. And she said, Why, Connie, I can come over to the house and heal him for you. I said, You can? I said, Phyllis, he lost both legs above the knees. She said, it doesn't matter. I can come heal him for you. I said, tell me, Phyllis, how do you plan to accomplish that? She said, I've been studying healing. I said, well, I'm sure that if you think you can come heal him, you must have been. But I still don't understand how would you accomplish that. She said, with cosmic energies I receive from the universe. Well, I looked at Glenn Page. He looked at me. He was the young man. He's now been a highly respected member of the prosecutor's staff for many years. And we excused ourselves. Miraculously, we didn't break out laughing. And we got upstairs, and I, we both burst out laughing. And I laughed so hard, I almost hyperventilated. And I said, if she comes over, and puts those legs back on him. She will make a believer out of me. 
And I didn't think one more thing about it until she's introduced as the campaign manager. And I thought, boy, this is good. She's going to come finance this campaign with cosmic money she receives from the universe. <laughs> Still didn't think anything more about it. And Phyllis got up and gave a talk. And she said, when you see Al, you are to visualize him on the councilman's chair. And through this act of visualization, you will gain the cooperation of the higher powers of the universe who will work to bring his vision into manifestation. She said, I have been a student of the mind sciences for the last 20 years. Well, I had been acquainted with her for 14 of those 20 years. And I thought, I wonder if Phyllis is part of this. Mind science, visualization, those were things that Marilyn Ferguson discussed in the Aquarian Conspiracy. So when the party broke up, I went over to Phyllis and I said, Phyllis, I said, I heard you mention the mind sciences. She said, yes. I said, you know, years ago I read a book called Psycho-Cybernetics by Matthew Monks. And I've been so interested in the mind sciences since then. Maybe you would like to go to dinner with me and you can tell me more about it. And she said, yes, now you have to watch us lawyers. We're really tricky. You can get a lot of information for the price of a meal. <laughs> I had a gold mine that night. I took her to dinner. She was very careful about ordering the red zinger teas and the vegetarian entrees. And I said, now tell me about the mind sciences. I'm fascinated. She said, it's part of the New Age movement. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. I said, no, at least not by that name. Is it possibly known by another name? Any other name? She said, yes, the, it's called the, uh, sometimes called the holistic movement, the networking movement, the new consciousness movement. She said, there are other names. Those are some of the most important. And, oh, she meant, didn't mention Age of Aquarius. And at that point, I held up the Aquarian gospel, and I said, Phyllis, is this by any chance part of it? She said, why, yes, it certainly is. Now, so help me, I did not know they had a slogan that when the pupil is ready, the master will appear. And so I said to Phyllis, I said, what do you do in this movement? She said, we communicate with code words and signals. And I said, Phyllis, I've been studying on my own for a little while, the best I could without a good teacher like you. Remember, I didn't know that slogan then. And I said, I think I may know some of the words. Can you help me? And she said, yes. And I said, holistic. She almost fell off her chair. Spaceship Earth, Global Village, Interdependence, global, uh, so on and so forth. And she told me a few more I should add to my repertoire. And then I said, well, communicating is fine and fun, but what are we communicating about? She said, we believe the mind operates on principles just as one's body operates on principles. And if you want your mind to work effectively for you, you must know those principles. So, well, that's logical enough. Tell me, what are some of the principles? And she said, the most important principle of all is karma. And I had noticed this strong thread of mysticism running through it, both Eastern and Western. And I said, uh, Phyllis, I said, could this possibly have anything to do with Eastern religions? She said, well, yes, Eastern religions are part of it, but we're much larger than the Eastern religions. And I did an inward gulp, talking about two thirds of the world's population, and we're bigger than that. And. Anyway, our food's delivered, and I, um, I said to Phyllis, I said, um, Phyllis, I said, I have to tell you, I've read The Aquarian Conspiracy. And when I said that, she frowned very deeply. And she said, Marilyn Ferguson is a friend of mine. We've appeared on many speakers' platforms together. She said, but you have to remember her limitations. She's only a reporter of the brain-mind movement. 
add that as another name. She said, her book didn't really tell it the way it was. And I really thought she was probing because Marilyn Ferguson said they would probe to see if there was any hint of opposition because their ideas had been too easily misunderstood in the past. And she had also written that this time they were going to succeed because global communications had encircled the globe beyond any possibility of retreat with fax machines and commun commu computer communication. And anyway, I thought Phyllis was trying to see if I was opposed to it. And I said to her, I said, Phyllis, I said, I read that book. It looked like a really good book to me. I said, tell me, what's wrong with it? She said, then she smiled and said the movement is much, much larger than she reported it as being. And she was all smiles again. Marilyn Ferguson had understated the case, underreported the movement. And at that point I said to Phyllis, I said, Phyllis, I said, you're going to think I'm crazy. I said, but in my spare time since Barry's accident, I've become quite the Bible student. I am convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that this may very well be what was described in the Bible as the last day political social movement that would bring the Antichrist on the scene. And I was really expecting her to say, you're crazy. She didn't. She still thought I wanted to come on board. She said, oh, yes, she said, that's very perceptive of you. She said, I've been convinced of that for many years myself. And I, I had a Bible with this tape in my stack of books, and I opened it up, and I showed her Daniel 11:38 passage, he shall honor in his estate the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. And I turned to a page in the Aquarian Gospel and said, one may enter fully into the spirit of the God of forces. And she said, you saw it, you saw it. She said, that's such an important point. Most students of esotericism fail to grasp it immediately. Well, if I'd wanted to, I probably could have taken over the Theosophical Society. <laughs> but, and she said, also, you must remember that in the New Age movement, and at Unity, she was a biofeedback instructor at Detroit's Unity Temple. She said, we believe Jesus and the Christ are two separate entities. The Christ is an office, not a man. Well, I quoted scripture to her, who is a liar, but he that denies Jesus of the Christ. is antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. And suddenly, she had a mystic crystal revelation. She told me too much. And she started trying frantically to take it back. And she said, you know, Connie, it's very difficult for me to talk to you because she said, I've received a vision of light. Now, you have to understand they have this in common, this vision of light. She said, you should pray for wisdom that God would show you the hidden meaning of these Bible passages. I said, well, I said, I'm not a theologian. I said, but I am a lawyer. And we were taught rules of construction that seem just as appropriate for Bible study as for legal construction, and that's ambiguities are construed against the maker of the document, and words are to be given their plain meaning. I said, I don't know about you, but I have enough faith in our maker to believe that he would not deliberately give us an ambiguous document. She said, are you familiar with the history of the Bible and how it was written and how contradictory it is? I said, yes, I'm familiar with the history of the Bible and how it was written, but I disagree with you on the contradictory aspect. I said, tell me, Phyllis, have you read the Bible all the way through? She said, no, I've carefully avoided doing that because it might tend to confuse me. I said, would you read Homer? Would you criticize Homer without having read it? Would you criticize Shakespeare without having read it? I said, let me tell you something. I said, I did read it all the way through. I said, I didn't find all those contradictions that people speak of. 
I said, when I read it all the way through, I said, I found myself understanding and in full agreement. And anyway, I was, she was not enjoying her food any longer. I was enjoying mine. I wasn't going to let the devil, the Antichrist, or anything else interfere with a good meal. And she started gritting her teeth and she says, it's just not right. It's not right. That book is simply too misleading. It shouldn't be misallowed. And I looked over and I said, what's that, Phyllis? And she almost spit it out. She said, the Bible. I said, why on earth would you say a thing like that? And she spit it out again and she said, the Antichrist is not the negative thing the Bible's made him out to be. I said, Phyllis, I said, I like you very much. Don't get caught on the wrong side of this one. And she said, what is a common New Age theme, and it's their theme for the militant march, they're now back on, there are no sides. Well, armed with the terminology New Age movement, I knew how to look it up. And I started collecting books, and I found the Bantam New Age series, and one of the first books I picked up was a book, and you might be familiar with this, Entropy by Jeremy Rifkin. And another book was Voluntary Simplicity by Duane Elgin, whom the New Agers credit with being the modern theoretician of their sustainable development movement, D-U-A-N-E, E-L-G-I-N. And those were both books I picked up both in, back in 1981, 1982 uh, on the subject. And when I started perusing the books, and, I, and the, I found a book called New Age Politics by Mark Satin. And he listed 25 representative New Age groups. And they range from Amnesty International through zero population growth. And about everything in between you could think of, including World Goodwill, New York, his amended version of the book, has 100 on the list. And as regards World Goodwill, he said they were working for preparing for the reappearance of the Christ. And Planetary Citizens was working in conjunction with them. And he described this new politics. It was neither left nor right, but center. And it was about doing things in different ways, thinking different ways, new patterns, and he wrote about a very broad spectrum of groups that were consciously collaborating. And my position was if they had the nerve to say it, I had the nerve to quote them. And so I started compiling these and people got seminars and presentations of the informal type in my office. Professors came over from Wayne State University. I talked to an old professor of mine and I said, I think this is a modern form of Nazism reborn. And he came over and he looked through the materials and uh, particularly Friends of the Earth, which was another group I'm sure you're familiar with. And another one was Dave Foreman with his, in fact, he, Dave Foreman wanted to reduce the Earth's population in some of the seminal writings I had to 75,000 and start over with a new nucleus. And I would, I, in fact, I deprogrammed many New Agers, showing them those materials. And eventually I found a book called Running God's Plan by Foster Bailey. And he said one of the goals of their hierarchy was to have a unified Europe. He said, we tried this before, working through a disciple using the Rhine River Valley and the inhabitants of that valley as a binding factor. That attempt was unsuccessful, but now another attempt is in full swing, namely the Six Nation European Common Market. And you don't need to have been even an A student in history to have known who that disciple was, Adolf Hitler. And 
one day I found a book. My son had pulled out a newspaper column for me and said, Mom, this sounds like what you were talking about. It was an advertisement for a bookstore called New Age or Mayflower Books. And they, were, they said they were a sort of metaphysical clubhouse. And I went over there one night and he said, we're closing. And I said, I'll pay cash and I need some very specific things and I'll be quick. I made, I made a long trip to get here. And he said, well, all right. And I said, do you have anything on the New Age movement? And he looked at me like I was crazy and he said, lady, the whole store. And he said, I said, do you have anything on Finehorn? Because I'd found a book called The Magic of Finhorn. And he corrected my pronunciation. He said, you mean Finhorn? He said, our Finhorn section is right down there. Our David Spangler section is right down there, too. And so I bought a selection of those books and a book by a very gossipy New Ager called Roland Gammon called Nirvana Now. And took them and analyzed them. And Reflections on the Christ by David Spangler you could carry into any Christian service probably not attract a lot of attention, except they might think you were really pious. But inside that book, chapter called Lucifer, Christ, and God. And he said, Lucifer comes to bring us the final gift of wholeness. If we accept it, we are free, and he is free. And he said, the Luciferic initiation is a required entry point into the new age. And I didn't leave it at that. I never take one source as my source. I eventually found the Alice Bailey books. And I was to read from a, another source that they had started life as Lucifer Publishing Company, which they adamantly denied for a time. But unfortunately for them, I now have three books in my personal library from them when they were Lucifer Publishing Company, 1922. And Alice Bailey had been a member of the Theosophical Society. And she and her husband, Foster Bailey, had in 1922, during the years that the Theosophists were promoting a man called Jiddu Krishnamurti as their new messiah. And they started a work in New York City. And they um, then formed some worldwide works. And one of their strongest devotees was a man that you talked about, Morris Strong. And I actually have a photograph, which I pulled down from the internet, of Morris Strong at the Finhorn Foundation in Scotland, participating very devoutly in a group meditation for the reappearance of their new Christ. And I knew what a Marilyn Ferguson in the Aquarian Conspiracy had said something that I didn't think of until I got much further with my work. And she said, Europe represented the ideal point from which to launch their new political spiritual entity, that it was eminently qualified. She quoted a man called Johannes Kanye. That was my first war. I started speaking against it, making presentations, trying to get the attention of anybody I could, largely unsuccessfully. We formed our own little group in Detroit. The priest that was interested uh, had the idea that he could organize talks. He collaborated with my law partner who thought I was spending too much time on it. He was right. And that instead of seminars for each and every client, we could invite people on Saturday afternoons to have coffee and cookie and cookies and, and uh, meet in the library of, of their particular school. And so we did. We kind of had our own ecumenical group going. We had, you name it, we had Seventh-day Adventists, Baptists, Church of the Nazarene, Catholics, Episcopalians, everybody concerned about what I was showing them evidence-wise. And it stayed at probably about 35 people coming per average. People would come, and the same people would come back every time. And the priest of the parish walked in one day, the senior priest, and he said, I'm going to have to check this out. And he said, you talk to them for five hours. They sit on the edge of their seats. I talk to them for 20 minutes, and they fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> 
November 4th, 1981, I heard a very interesting man speak in Detroit. And I'll tell you how this came about. One day I went into that Mayflower bookstore and I spotted a book called The Reappearance of the Christ by Benjamin Cram. And I bought it, didn't think that much about it at the time. I had so many crazy books with similar themes. And the attorneys that I shared space with in downtown Detroit said, maybe you would like to use our computers to catalog these. I had the first Wang dedicated word processor in the office, but they had a TRS Model 3. And they said, you're welcome to use our computer and uh, get your own software, but you can use our computer, which I did. And the computer I used was Anita Baker's computer, the singer. She was the secretary for our office back in those days. And I was sitting at Anita Baker's computer, and I was trying to synthesize. Back in those days, the databases were very limited. You could use about maybe 50 words to describe something. So I looked through Benjamin Krem's book, and he had a section, How the Plan is Working Out. And he talked about all the political developments that were going on that they were working with. And I had suspected as much, but he was making some claims and making some fairly impressive statements. And I wrote, you, you have to see this one for yourself to believe it. And I carried that book then with me night and day. Went to court for a client in St. Clair Shores. I stopped at the big boy for breakfast and went to court and left court and I discovered that book was missing. Now, it wasn't the kind of book that you get on the phone you say, hello, my name is Constance Cumby, I'm an attorney. I left my copy of The Reappearance of the Christ by Benjamin Cram at your restaurant or at your courtroom. I was kind of hoping the janitor would just quietly throw it in the wastebasket and never say another word to anybody. I've represented folks on the mental health docket that were locked up for a lot less than that. <laughs> but I had to have that book. And so that night, I closed up shop early. I ran down to the Mayflower before closing time. And John Barneswell, the assistant manager who had sold me the first materials, the one I had encountered the first day, I said, uh, do you have the reappearance of the Christ by Benjamin Cram? He said, nope, Constance, sorry, we're all sold out. They were well familiar with what my work was at that point. And then he handed me a flyer. He said, but here, Unity's bringing him to town. You can hear him in person. And that flyer, the text of it is reproduced in my first book, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, and a true copy is reproduced in the second book, A Planned Deception. And I just stared at that thing. I said, this guy's no Christ, that's for sure. But if unity is trying to pass this on, and they were very politically powerful in Detroit, I said, something's happening. And so... I made plans to attend and I took about eight Christian spies with me, a couple of big ones. And I didn't want to be alone with that crowd. And it was an interesting evening, to put it mildly. I walked in, there were about 1,300 people in the hall, hall seat of 1,300, oh, every seat was taken and there were a lot of people standing besides. And I was stunned at the makeup of the hall. There was a former head of the Detroit Council of Churches who I knew from Detroit political circles. The entire Holistic Health Medical Association was sitting there very attentively, and their, mass, and their publicity director was acting as master of ceremonies for the evening, Dan Butts. And very saw lots of prominent people in the crowd, and I saw people that had been friends. I saw my for, a former law partner sitting across the room. And my accountant was in the room. I turned to a fellow behind me who was an independent movie producer, who had, and I said, Al, I know what I'm doing here tonight. What are you doing here? He said, because, Connie, he said, I'm taking a course in unity, a course in miracles at unity. He said, we are required to take a spiritual growth 
class when we join Unity. And I'm taking a course in miracles and it's a class requirement that we attend. And I gave him a quick synopsized version of my objections to what was taking place that night. And he thanked me. And then Benjamin Krem walked in and he did something with his hands. I don't know how to replicate it. It was like a wave. It looked something like that. And simultaneously, about everybody in the room but myself and my spies appeared to go into a very deep, instantaneous trance. And Benjamin Krem got up. He twisted his neck around almost as, it was as close to a 360 degree turn of a neck as I've ever seen. Normally, I can stare about anybody down. I did not want to try. His eyes were abnormally bright. I attributed it to the very expensive sodium lighting they had for the video series they were obviously attempting to make. I coughed. I did everything I could to try to break the spell on people, rustled the papers on my lap. <laughs> when they took the first break, there was a rather heavy set woman sitting there. I tried to come through and she, she put her knees out so I couldn't move. I said, excuse me, she said, that will teach you not to rustle papers when he is speaking. I'm sure under normal circumstances she would not have dreamed of that type of social behavior. Well, Benjamin Krem had announced that after the break they should regather and they would do a mass recitation of the great invocation. This is the prayer by Alice Bailey from the point of light within the mind of God may light stream forth, so on and so forth. It literally is a prayer to the Antichrist to come and take the world for Lucifer. And the last line of that quote prayer is let light and love and power restore the plan on earth and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Which I had already learned from reading the Bailey books that that meant sealing Jews, Christians and Muslims off into their own separate place. And basically, they were going to be the phoenix that would arise from the ashes to build a new civilization. Woman delegates came back. The crowd was starting to thin out. It was getting close to 11 o'clock at night. He'd started at 6 p.m. at night. I guess folks had to go to work. And the woman that came next stood next to me, very prim, a little black lady, very neat, very trim. And she looked like she could have been an activist in any black Baptist church in Detroit, head of the altar committee or something. And I turned to her as gently as I could. And I said, I hope it does not offend you. But I will not be reciting the great invocation with you. I will say my own prayer. She said, no, honey, that's all right. We all have our own paths to God. And I said, the reason I will not say the great invocation is the scripture said very clearly, the Antichrist would come and deny that Jesus was the Christ. I said, Benjamin Krem has denied it fervently all evening on behalf of this Maitreya character. And the woman said, there's been many Christs. I said, there's been one. His name is Jesus. And they turned from rows around and looked at me like I was from outer space. This is the church that popular, uh, the same area where Marianne Ger uh, Williamson later went to become a guru of, um, head of a Michi large Michigan Unity Church. And many of the same people were in attendance. And this was the Palmer Park Church. She took the Warren Church. At any rate, Benjamin Cram came in and he promised the group they were going to recite the great invocation and then he was going to have a transmission from Maitreya the Christ as soon as that thing was over. But they would say the great invocation first. And his literature said he'd been overshadowed by Maitreya the Christ everywhere and delivered a message. I started, or they started, from the point of light within the mind of God, may light stream forth, and I went nice and clear and all the acoustics in that room were wonderful. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I did that every single stanza. 
And they got down to the last part and said that light and love and power restore the plan on earth and may it seal the door where evil dwells. And I said nice and clear, may Jesus Christ return to earth and end the evil present in this room tonight. Well, the funniest thing happened, or may I say it didn't happen, and this was the spookiest thing of the whole evening. Benjamin Krem waited and waited and waited. It was clear he was not faking it. He was waiting for something to happen that never happened. This thing did not come and overshadow him. He finally, he dismissed the crowd and said, that will be all. We went out, and of course, everybody's glaring at me. And Dan Butts, the one who was the master of ceremonies for the evening, glared at me. And another one said something sharp to me in Dan Butt's presence. And I said, well, I said, if you're new, Maitreya the Christ, Betreya the Christ, or whatever his name's supposed to be, where everything he was cracked up to be, one lousy Christian in the room reciting the Lord's Prayer shouldn't have stopped him. And we honestly thought things were going to happen. They were running ads in their magazines. They were publishing books. They really thought they were going to carry it off. And their magazines had ads, Expect the Christ in the spring of 1982. And they thought things were going to happen on the day of the syzygy, November, or March the 10th, 1982. And it was a, weather-wise, it was a disastrous day for the Detroit area. I drove my son to school and we went through some floods to get there. And he read me an article from the Detroit Free Press by a reporter I had noticed had written many pro-New Age articles. In fact, the day after Benjamin Krem spoke, there were headlines in the Free Press with the same Dan Butts picture, hand in hand through the New Age. And she said, Zoom not doom. And she said, this syzygy was a great thing. It meant maybe even a new Messiah was on his way. I was so depressed, so discouraged, the weather didn't add to my mood. She said that all these things were taking place this day, that even in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is my hometown, that a man, John Davis, from Wyoming, Michigan, would be giving a talk for the Coptic Fellowship, the three stages of the Christ's reappearance. And I thought there's just no way to stop this. And I looked at that paper all day, and finally that afternoon, I picked up the phone, I don't know why, I picked up the phone and I called the Detroit Free Press. And I asked if I could please speak to the reporter who wrote the article, it was Ruth Seymour's byline. And they said she was unavailable, I left word, said I'm an attorney in downtown Detroit, I would like to speak to her, I have some material that might be of interest. She called me back approximately 15 minutes later. And I was going to say something very sharp to her, but she sounded so scared I couldn't bring myself to do it. And I said, You're, you've written several articles about the New Age movement. She said, yes, I have. I said, how would you like to see the flip side of that movement? I said, she said, what do you mean? I said, I've examined it carefully. It's identical to Nazism. She said, why do you say that? And I quoted the Foster Bailey passage I read to you about Europe. And then I said, they're using 666 and calling it a sacred number. She said, oh, creepy. <laughs> I said, I lecture on this every other week at St. Genevieve's School in um, Livonia. I said, if you like, I would be very happy to make a copy of my lecture out notes outline for you. And you can check my references for yourself and see if I've been accurate. She said, no, if it's all right with you, I would like to come over to your office right now and look at your materials. I said, fine. And she came in, she looked like one of the original flower children left over from the 60s. And I'm not saying that to put her down. 
And she, we started going through them and she went, wow, wow. She was noticing things I wasn't noticing. And she said, look at this, look at this. And she finally said, why did you decide to call me today? I said, I really don't know. She said, you must, she said, knowing what you know about this, she said, you had to have been only angry at my past work. I said, yes. She said, I'll bet you thought of writing letters to my editors. In fact, I and every other attorney in the office, both Christian and Jewish, were going to write those letters. We Several times we'd thought about a, a writing campaign, a serious writing campaign. She said, I bet you thought of writing letters to my editor. And I said, yes, I thought of it. She said, well, it's a good thing you didn't. I wouldn't have listened. And then she persisted some more. She said, what made you decide to call me today? And I finally said, Ruth, I really can't explain it. I said, but I was looking at your article, and all at once I felt it very important that I talk to you immediately. She said, you don't know it, but she said, 15 minutes before you called, I went to the ladies' lounge of the free press. She said, and I knelt down on my face, Eastern cell. I probably called her around 3.15, and it was 3 o'clock that they were going to go do their group, whatever, med meditations to invoke the Christ that day. She said, I got down on my face, flat on my face, Eastern style, and I was going to pray to Buddha. She said, all at once I changed my mind. I prayed to Jesus. She said, and I prayed that he would send me revelation. She said, look, now I have revelation. <laughs> and she left my office a brand new Christian that night. And she then was determined that I should finish that book that I was procrastinating on. And she called, she um, would collect materials for me. Lots of materials that were channeled to them came to me. Am I running into my deadline, Dr. Stan? Okay. Anyway, let me, let me make a long story short. That was the first war I fought. And I had a horrible, ugly opposition from the evangelical community. There was no New Age movement. I had made the whole thing up. For three years, I stood alone with those folks, virtually alone. And then they came out with their own books and tapes and conferences and first tried to redefine it. The New Agers were not politically networked. They said, yes, they were. They always were. It's not serious. It's not deadly. And I did not know what was going on. And that was the first war we fought to get the word out on the New Age movement. We succeeded. The word did go out on the New Age movement worldwide. And the second battle I fought, I will tell you about in my next talk, and we will have PowerPoint for that. And that was the European Union, Javier Solana, and the two are inextricably related. So stand by. Thank you.